Okay, hello everybody. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, I hope everybody's great. And like I always say to you guys, if you're not happy about something, do something about it. I mean, I'm not in my best of moods today. Um, I'm really not. I'm really not in my best of moods. And I am going to do something about it. Definitely going to do something about it. Um, I have a few updates but i'm not gonna update you guys on this video so today we are back and i'm just gonna get straight into it because i am on my way out i'm going to meet my friend kingsley because we've been trying to meet for like weeks and i always postpone something comes up and i always postpone yes it's me i'm the problem it's me um and <laughs> i fail i fail him every time but today i'm definitely going even though i'm late but i was like you know what let me just shoot this video so i've been reading this book ne? called everything is fucked a book about hope by mark mason remember the first video that i posted was um the salsa of not giving a fuck i think this is the book that came after that it's called everything is fucked the book about hope sharp so i'm not done reading this book i actually got this book as a gift this is how much i'm left with um this the, these pages i'm not done reading this book um but i came across this chapter and this is the chapter that answered a lot of my questions and i know that a lot of us have the same that type of, like the same question i know most of us are struggling finding the answer to that and the question basically is how is it that a, a 40 year old a 50 year old still acts and thinks and speaks like an adolescent or like a child um, especially when you're in a relationship with someone or just having friends or people that you encounter and you're like for your age i would literally expect i would like i would i would expect you to make sense more um to reason better um you know those type of things and this chapter actually put everything into perspective for me and i am honestly and truly appreciative of that so let's get into the chapter it's chapter six uh, part two of the book chapter six um it's a long chapter so i don't know if i'm going to make it into two videos or what but i think i'm gonna stop somewhere because i have to leave at least make it to so it's like half past three i hope so i'm gonna stop at like two at like three because right now it's 14 22 and i'm gonna stop at like three wherever i feel like okay we'll, we'll continue chapter six the title is called The Formula of Humanity. Depending on your perspective, the philosopher Immanuel Kant was either the most boring person who ever lived or a productivity hacker's wet dream. For 40 years, he woke up every morning at 5 o'clock and wrote for exactly 3 hours. He would then lecture at the same university for exactly 4 hours and then eat lunch at the same restaurant every day. Then in the afternoon, he would go on an extended walk through the same park on the same route, leaving and returning home at the exact same time. He did this for 40 years every single day. Kant was efficiency personified. He was so mechanical in his habits that his neighbors joked that they could set their clocks by when he left his apartment. He would depart for his daily walk at 3.30 in the afternoon, have dinner with the same friend most evenings, and after work, working some more, would go to bed at exactly 10 every night. Despite sounding like a colossal bore, Kant was one of the most important and influential thinkers in, in world history. And from his single room apartment in Konoisberg, Prussia, he did more to stir the world than most kings, presidents, prime ministers, or generals before and since. If you are living in a democratic society that protects individual freedoms, you have Kant partially to thank for that. He was one of the first to argue that all people have an inherent dignity that must be regarded and respected. He was the first person ever to envision a global governing body that could guarantee peace across much of the world, an idea that would eventually inspire the formation of the United Nations. His descriptions of how we perceive space and time would later help inspire Einstein's discovery of the theory of relativity. He was one of the first to suggest the possibility of animal rights. He reinvented the philosophy of aesthetics and beauty. He resolved the 200 years of philosophical debate between rationalism and empiricism in the span of a couple of hundred pages. And if all that weren't enough, he reinvent, reinvented moral philosophy from top to bottom, overthrowing ideas that had been the basis of Western civilization since Aristotle. 
Kent was an intellectual powerhouse. If thinking brains had biceps, Kent's thinking brain was the Mr. Olympia of the intellectual universe. As with his lifestyle, Kent was rigid and uncompromising in his view of the world. He believed that there was a clear right and wrong, a value system that transcended and operated outside any human emotions or feeling brain's judgments. Moreover, he lived what he preached. Kings tried to censor him, priests condemned him, academics envied him, yet none of his slowed yet none of this slowed him down. Kent didn't give a fuck, and I mean that in the truest and profoundest sense of the phrase. He is the only thinker I have ever come across who eschewed hope and the flaw and the flawed human values in relied upon, who confronted the uncomfortable truth and refused to accept its horrible implications, who gazed into the abyss with nothing but logic and pure reason, who armed with only the brilliance of his mind, stood before the gods and attached and challenged them and somehow won. But to understand Kent's Herculean struggle, first we must take a detour and learn about psychological development, maturity and adulthood. This is where it all starts, right? How to grow. When I was like four years old, despite my mother wanting me not to, I put my finger on the hot stove. That day, I learned an important lesson. Really hot things suck. They burn you and you want to avoid touching them ever again. Around the same time, I made another important discovery. Ice cream was stored in the freezer on a shelf that could be easily accessed if I stood on my tippy toes. One day, while my mother was in the other room, poor mom, I grabbed the ice cream, sat on the floor, and proceeded to gorge myself using my bare hands. It was the closest I would come to an orgasm for another 10 years. If there was a heaven in my little 40-year-old mind, uh, if there was heaven in my little 4-year-old mind, I had just found it, my own little Elysium in a bucket of congealed divinity. As the ice cream began to melt, I smeared an extra helping across my face, letting it dribble all over my shirt. This was all happening in slow motion, of course. I was practically bathing in that sweet, tasty goodness. Oh yes, glorious sugary milk. Share with me your secret for today. I shall know greatness. Then mom walked in and all hell broke loose, which included, but not limited to a much needed bath. I learned a couple of lessons that day. One, stealing ice cream and then dumping it all over yourself and the kitchen floors makes your mother extremely angry. And two, angry mothers suck. They scold you and punish you. That day, much like the day with the hot stove, I learned what not to do. But there was a third meta lesson being taught here. One of those lessons that are so obvious we don't even notice when they happen. A lesson that was far more important than the other lessons. Eating ice cream is better than being burned. This lesson was important because it was a value judgment. Ice cream is better than hot stoves. I prefer sugary sweetness in my mouth than a bit of fire on my hand. It was the discovery of preference and therefore prioritization. It was my feeling brain's decision that one thing in the world was better than the other, the construction of my early value hierarchy. A friend of mine once described parenthood as basically just following around a kid for a couple of decades and making sure he doesn't accidentally kill himself. And you'd be amazed how many ways a kid can find to accidentally kill himself. Young children are always looking for new ways to accidentally kill themselves because the driving force behind their psychology is exploration. Early in life, we are driven to explore the world around us because our feeling brains are collecting information on what pleases and harms us, what feels good and bad, what is worth pursuing further and what is worth avoiding. We are building up our value hierarchy figuring out what our first and primary values are so that we can begin to know what to hope for. Eventually, the exploratory phase exhausts itself and not because we run out of worlds to explore actually is the opposite. The exploratory phase wraps up because as we become older, we begin to recognize that there's too much world to explore. You can't touch and taste everything. You can't meet all the people. You can't see all the things. There's too much potential experience and the sheer magnitude of our own existence overwhelms and intimidates us therefore our two brains begin to focus less on trying everything and more on developing some rules to help us navigate the endless complexity of the world before us we adapt most of these rules from our parents and teachers but many of them we figure out for ourselves for instance after fucking around near open flames enough you develop a little mental rule that all flames are dangerous and not just stove ones and after Seeing mom get pissed off enough times, you begin to figure out that raiding the freezer and stealing dessert is always bad, not just when it's ice cream. Alright? As a result, some general principles begin to emerge in our minds, 
take care around dangerous things so you won't get hurt to be honest with your parents and they'll treat you well share with your siblings and they'll share with you these new values are more sophisticated because they are abstract you can't point to fairness or draw a picture of prudence the little kid thinks ice cream is awesome therefore i want ice cream but the adolescent thinks ice cream is awesome but stealing stuff pisses my parents off and i'll get punished therefore i'm not going to take the ice cream from the freezer the adolescent applies if or then rules to her decision making thinking through cause and effect chains in a way that a young child cannot as a result, an adolescent learns that strictly pursuing her own pleasure and avoiding pain often creates problems. Actions have consequences. You must negotiate your desires with the desires of those around you. You must play by the rules of society and authority, and then more often than not, you'll be rewarded. This is maturity in action. Developing higher level and more abstract values to enhance decision making in a wider range of contexts. This is how you adjust to the world, how you learn to handle the seemingly infinite permutations of experience it is a major cognitive leap for children and fundamental to growing up in a healthy happy way so they did this what is this diagram they say child equals pleasure remember the only thing that a child thinks about is i just want ice cream and adolescent think there are principles um that will then result in pressure so you must follow certain principles before you get the pleasure pleasure that you want um, and that is like maturity in in essence from a child to being an adolescent young children are like little tyrants they struggle to conceive of anything in life beyond what is immediately pleasurable or painful for them at any given moment they cannot feel empathy they cannot imagine what life is like in your shoes all they know is that they want some fucking ice cream a young child's identity is therefore very small and fragile. It is constituted by simply what gives pleasure and what avoids pain. Susie likes chocolate. She is afraid of dogs. She enjoys coloring. She is often mean to her brother. This is the extent of Susie's identity before, because her thinking brain has not yet developed enough meaning to create coherent stories for her. It's only when she's old enough to ask what the pleasure is for what the pain is for, that she can develop some meaningful narratives for herself and establish identity. The knowledge of pleasure and pain is still there in adolescence. It's just that pleasure and play, pain are no longer... No. It's just that pleasure and pain no longer dictate most decision-making. They are no longer the basis of our values. All the children weigh their personal feelings against their understanding of rules, trade-offs, and the social order around them to plan and make decisions. This gives them larger, steadier identities. The adolescent does the same stumbling around the young child does in learning what is pleasurable and what is painful. Except the adolescent stumbles around by trying um, on different social rules and roles. If I wear this, will it make me cool? If I like that, will it make people like me? If I pretend to enjoy this music, will I be popular? This is an improvement, but there's still a weakness in this adolescent's approach to life. Everything's seen as a trade-off. Adolescents approach life as an endless series of bargains. I will do what my boss says so I can get money. I will call my mother so I don't get yelled at. I will do my homework so I don't fuck up my future. I will lie and pretend to be nice so I don't have to deal with conflict. Nothing is done for its own sake. Everything is calculated. Everything is a calculated transaction, usually made out of fear of the negative repercussions. Everything is a means to some pleasurable end. The problem with adolescent values is that if you hold them, you never actually stand for something outside yourself. You are still a heart, at heart a child. A bit a cleverer and much more sophisticated child. Everything still revolves around maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. It's just that the adolescent is savvy enough to think a few moves ahead to get there. In the end, adolescent values are self-defeating. You can't live your entire life this way. Otherwise, you are never actually living your own life. You are merely living out an aggregation of the desire of the people around you. To become an emotionally healthy individual, you must break out of this constant bargaining endlessly treating everyone as a means to some pleasurable end and come to understand even higher and more abstract guiding principles Stop. and then we get to how to be an adult uh, this one this one is very important <laughs> 
it's very important because i think a lot of people who watch this are adults i consider myself an adult um when you google how to be an adult most of the results focus on preparing for a job interviews managing your finances cleaning up after yourself and not being a total asshole these things are all great and indeed they are all things that adults are expected to do but i would argue that by themselves they do not make you an adult they simply prevent you from being a child which is not the same thing that's because most people who do these things do them because they are rule and transaction based they are a means to some superficial end you prepare for a job interview because you want to get a good job you learn how to clean your house because its level of cleanliness has direct consequences on what people think of you you manage your finances because if you don't you will be royally fucked one day down the road bargaining with rules and the social social order allows us to be well functioning human beings in the world eventually though we realize that the most important things in life cannot be gained through bargaining you don't want to bargain with your father for love or your friends for companionship or your boss for respect bargaining with people into loving or respecting you feels shitty it undermines the whole project if you have to convince someone to love you then they don't love you if you have to cajole someone into respecting you then they will never respect you if you have to convince someone to trust you then they won't actually trust you the most precious and important things in life are by definition non transactional and to try to bargain for them is to immediately destroy them you cannot conspire for happiness it is impossible but this is often what people try to do especially when they seek out self help and other personal development advice they are essentially saying show me the rules of the game i have to play and i'll play it not realizing that it's the very fact that they think there are rules to happiness that is preventing them from being happy while people who navigate life through bargaining and rules can get far in the material world they remain crippled and alone in the emotional world This is because transactional values create relationships that are built upon manipulation. Adulthood is the realization that sometimes an abstract principle is right and good for its own sake, that even if it hurts you today, even if it hurts others, being honest is still the right thing to do. In the same way that adolescent realizes there's more to the world than the child's pleasure or pain, the adult realizes that there's more to the world than the adolescent's constant bargaining for validation, approval and satisfaction. Becoming an adult is therefore developing the ability to do what is right for the simple reason that it is a right. An adolescent will say that she values honesty only because she learned that saying so produces good results. But when confronted with difficult conversations, she will tell white lies, exaggerate the truth and become passive aggressive. An adult will be honest for the simple sake that honesty is more important than her own pleasure or pain. Honesty is more important than getting what you want or achieving a goal. Honesty is inherently good and valuable in and of itself. Honesty is therefore an end, not a means to some other end. An adolescent will say he loves you, but his conception of love is that he is getting something in return. That love is merely an emotional swap meet where you each bring everything you have to offer and haggle with each other for the best deal. An adult will love freely without expecting anything in return because an adult understands that it is the only thing that can make love real. An adult will give you will give without seeking anything in return because to do so defeats the perfect of the purpose of a gift in the first place. The principal values of adulthood are unconditional. That is, they cannot be reached through any other means. They are ends in and of themselves. And then they have this diagram that now includes an adult. It says child equals pleasure adolescence equals principle therefore pleasure adult is just equal principles there are plenty of grown as children in the world and there are a lot of aging adolescents hell there are even some young adults out there that's because past a certain point maturity has nothing to do with age what matters are a person's intentions the difference between a child and adolescent and an adult is not how old they are or what they do but why they do something the child steals the ice cream because it feels good and he is oblivious or indifferent to the consequences the adolescent doesn't steal because he knows it will create worse consequences in the future but his decision is anti ultimately a bargain with his future self I'll forego some pleasure now to prevent greater future pain. But it's only the adult who doesn't steal for the simple principle that stealing is wrong. And to steal even if it gets even if she gets away with it would make her feel worse about herself. Okay, cool. 
and learn why we don't grow, right? When we are little kids, the way we learn to transcend the pleasure or pain values, ice cream is good, hot stoves are bad, is by pursuing those values and seeing how they fail us. It's only the, by experiencing the pain of their failure that we learn to transcend them. We steal the ice cream, mom get pissed off and punishes us, suddenly ice cream is good, doesn't seem as straight, straightforward as it used to. There are lots, there are all sorts of other factors to consider. I like ice cream and I like mom. By taking the ice cream will upset mom, but taking the ice cream will upset mom. What do I do? Eventually, the child is forced to reckon with the fact that there are trade-offs that must be negotiated. This is essentially what good early parenting boils down to, implementing the correct consequences for a child's pleasure or pain-driven behavior. Punish them for stealing ice cream, reward them for sitting quietly in a restaurant. You are helping them understand that life is far more complicated than their own impulses or desires. Parents who fail to do this fail their, child, their children in an incre incredibly fundamental way because it won't take long for the child to have the shocking realization that the world does not cater to his whims. Learning this as an adult is incredibly painful, far more painful than it would have been had the child learned the lessons when he was younger. He will be socially punished by his peers and society for not understanding it. Nobody wants to be friends with a selfish brat. No one wants to work with someone who doesn't consider others' feelings or appreciate rules. No society accepts someone who metaphorically or literally steals the ice cream from the freezer. The untaught child will be shunned, ridiculed, and punished for his behavior in the adult world, which will result in even more pain and suffering. Parents can fail their children in another way. They can abuse them. An abused child also does not develop beyond his pain and pleasure-driven values because his punishment follows no logical pattern and doesn't reinforce deeper, more abstract values. Instead, the predictable failures, his experience is just random and cruel. Stealing ice cream sometimes results in overly harsh punishment and other times it results in no consequences at all. Therefore, no lesson is learned. No higher values are produced. No development takes place. The child never learns to control his own behavior and develops coping mechanisms to deal with the incessant pain. This is why children who are abused and children who are coddled often end up with the same issues when they become adults. They remain stuck in their childhood value systems. Ultimately, graduating to adolescence requires trust. A child must trust that her behavior will produce predictable outcomes. Stealing always creates bad outcomes. Touching a hot stove also creates bad outcomes. Trusting in these outcomes is what allows the child to develop rules and principles around them. The same is true once the child grows older and enters society. A society without trustworthy institutions or leaders cannot develop rules and roles without trust. There are no reliable principles to dictate decisions, therefore everything dissolves, devolves back into childish selfishness. People get stuck in the adolescent stage of values of similar reasons that they get stuck with childish values, trauma and or neglect. Victims of bullying are a particularly notable example. A person who has been bullied in his younger years will go through the world with an assumed understanding that no one will ever like or respect him unconditionally, that all affection must be hard worn. Um, oh, my friend is calling me. Hard worn through a series of practiced conversation and canned actions. You must dress a certain way, you must speak a certain way, you must act a certain way or else. Oh, I hate or else. I hate, I hate somebody saying or else to me. Some people become incredibly good at playing the bargaining game. They tend to be charming and charismatic and are naturally able to sense what other people want of them and to fulfill that role. This manipulation rarely fails them in any meaningful way, so they come to believe that this is simply how the world operates. This is one big high school gymnasium and you must shove people into lockers lest the air be shoved first. Adolescence needs to be shown that bargaining is a never-ending treadmill, that the only thing in life of real value and meaning are achieved without conditions, without transactions. It requires good parents and teachers not to succumb to the adolescence bargaining. The best way to do this is by example, of course, by showing unconditionality, by being unconditional yourself. The best way to teach an adolescent to trust is to trust him. The best way to teach an adolescent respect is to respect him. The best way to teach someone to love is by loving him. And you don't force the love or trust or respect on him. After all, that would make those things conditional. You simply give them, understanding that at some point, the adolescent's bargaining will fail and he'll understand the value of unconditionality when he's ready. 
When parents and teachers fail, it's usually because they themselves are stuck in an adolescent level of values. They too see the world is transactional terms. They do bag in love for sex, loyalty for affection, respect for obedience. In fact, they likely bargain with their children for affection, love and respect. They think this is normal, so the kid grows up thinking it's normal. And the shitty, shallow, transactional parent or child relationship is then re replicated when the kid goes out and forms relationships in the world. Because he then becomes a teacher or parent and imparts his adolescent values on children, causing the whole mess to continue to another generation. Once older, adolescent-minded people will move through the world assuming that all human relationships are a never-ending trade agreement. That intimacy is no more than a faint sense of knowing the other person for the mutual benefit of each other, that everyone is a means to some selfish end. And instead of recognizing that their problems are rooted in the transactional approach to the world itself, they will assume that the only problem is that it took them so long to do the transactions correctly. It's difficult to act unconditionally. You love someone knowing you may not be loved in return, but you do it anyway. You trust someone even though you realize you might get hurt or screwed over. That's because to act unconditionally requires some degree of faith. Faith that is the right thing to do, even if it results in more pain, even if it doesn't work out for you or the other person. Making the leap of faith into a virtuous adulthood requires to requires not just an ability to endure pain but also the courage to abandon hope to let go of the desire for things always to be better or more pleasant or a ton of fun your thinking brain will tell you that this is illogical that your assumptions must inevitably be wrong in some way yet you do it anyway your feeling brains is your feeling brain will procrastinate and freak out about the pain of brutal honesty, the vulnerability that comes with loving someone, the fear that comes from humanity, yet you do it anyway. Um, and then there's this. I don't know how I'm going to explain this. I'm going to try and put a picture if I do, if I'm able to. Um, it explains values. Okay, cool. It says, so it's childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. How children see values is through pleasure and pain. How adolescents see them is through rules and values. And how adults see them is through virtues. How children see relationships, they see them as power struggles. Adolescents see them as performances. And adults see them as vulnerability. How children see self-worth is narcissistic wide wings between I'm the best and I'm the worst. Adolescents see self-worth as other dependent externally validated. And adults see self-worth as independent, largely internally validated. How children see motivate, motivation is through self-aggrandizement. Adolescents see as self-acceptance and then adults see it as armor fati. how children see politics they are either extremist or nihilist um adolescent pragmatic or uh, pragmatic or ideological adulthood pragmat pragmatic non-ideological in order to grow he or she children needs trustworthy institution and dependable people adolescents need courage to let go of outcomes and faith in unconditional acts and adults need consistent self-awareness. Adult behaviors are ultimately seen as admir admirable and noteworthy. It's the boss who takes the fall for his employee's mistakes, the mother who gives up her own happiness for her child, the friend who tells you what you need to hear, even though it, it upsets you. It's these people who hold the world together. Without them, we'd all likely be fucked. It's no coincidence then that all the world's great religions push people towards these unconditional values, whether it's the unconditional forgiveness of Jesus Christ or the noble eightfold path of the Buddha or the perfect justice of Muhammad. In their purest forms, the world's great religions leverage our human instincts for hope to try to pull people upward toward adult virtues, or at least it's usually the original intention. Unfortunately, as they grow, religions inevitably get co-opted by transactional adolescents and narcissist children people who pervert the religious principles for their own personal gain every human religion succumbs to this failure of morality freely at some point no matter how beautiful and pure its doctrines it ultimately becomes a human institutions and all human institutions eventually become corrupted enlightenment philosophers excited by the opportunities afforded the world 
by growth decided to remove the spirituality from religion and get the job done with ideological religion they jet uh, they jettisoned the idea of virtue and instead focused on measurable concrete goals creating greater happiness and less suffering giving people greater personal li- liberties and freedoms and promoting compassion empathy and equality and these ideological religions like the spiritual religions before them also caved to the flawed nature nature of all human institutions when you attempt to batter for happiness you destroy happiness when you try to enforce freedom you negate freedom when you try to create equality you undermine equality none of these ideological religions confronted the fundamental issue at hand conditionality they either didn't admit or didn't deal with the fact that whatever you make your god value you will always be willing at some point to bargain any human value in order to get closer to it worshiping some supernatural god some abstract principle some bottomless desire when pursued long enough will always result in giving up your own humanity or the humanity of others in order to achieve the aims of that worship and what was supposed to save you from the suffering then plunges you back into suffering the cycle of hope destruction begins anew and this is where kant comes in I'm going to stop here because now they're going to talk about the story of Kant the one rule for life which is beautiful and I'm going to maybe I'm going to read it in another chapter but right now I have to run um in essence what this is saying is some people are stuck um and they are stuck maybe because of traumas and they are stuck because the firstly for adults to become they need to have been raised well some are lucky to raise themselves and to become proper adults but unfortunately an adult need to be raised with knowing that not everything is transactional as a child um you need to know what is wrong what is right and as an and as an adolescent you need to know that not everything is transactional as an adult you should know that there are no conditions you love without conditions you trust without conditions you put your all in everything even though you know that you might not get the returns that you hope for um and maybe then that's why you find somebody who cannot reason the way you would like them to reason because they're still stuck in being an adolescent or actually a young child um and that, that yeah i i mean that that this chapter actually broke my heart because now i understand that people don't just be, become immature um it's because of certain elements it's because of certain things that happened to them or that did not happen for them to realize that they actually have to grow um they actually have to change certain things um and it's actually very hard to start learning those things when you are old um that's what the book say it's it's very difficult to change certain habits if you know that stealing is stealing is stealing and you don't get the right punishment for it when you did it when you you didn't get the right punishment when you were a child then you literally get stuck with not knowing what is good and what is wrong and when people actually tell you now it becomes an offensive thing um and i think that's actually very sad but i hope we all look at ourselves deeper and see where we are um are we still stuck at being a child or an adolescent or are we actually an adult but the main thing about being an adult is not having conditions in everything that you do and that's one of the most hardest things um So yeah guys I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did I'm sorry I'm rushing through this um it's 3 and I know there might be traffic going that side um I hope you enjoyed this video if you liked it please don't forget to like share and subscribe share with your friends um I think everyone would appreciate hearing this this um this chapter so yeah enjoy guys and have a brilliant brilliant week thank you bye